EU Center for Community Engagement. We are so glad you're joining for this uh, Academic Community Engagement or ACE series event. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Dennis Scott. I serve in a, as an Associate Extension Professor and Extension Specialist, also uh, as the Assistant Director for Academic Engagement. I'll be moderating here today on behalf of members of the Center for Community Engagement, including Dr. Christy Wood-Turner, Assistant Dean and Director of the CCE, Melissa Calabrese, the Academic Community Engagement Coordinator, and our Dean, Dean Jorge Atiles. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're here for the next hour and a half to share some best practices, some case studies, and to ask some questions about how we might be able to nurture campus community partnerships invested in research, research by giving priority to community perspectives, honoring mutually beneficial partnerships, and today a great focus on upholding social justice values. So this A series aspires to showcase how higher education's involvement and in community engaged scholarship can be an impactful avenue for nurturing healthy communities. Today, I'll lead us off with a few questions. And then from there, I'll just encourage you to engage in, in whatever way feels right to you. You can use the chat. You can raise your emoji hand to speak. You can even send Melissa a direct message if you have a question that you want to ask, but maybe you don't want your name to be associated with it. So this conversation will be recorded. We'll be sharing it with registered participants. I'm just going to say in, in terms of the flow today, we really encourage you to feel okay with some moments of quiet. There may be moments that we're reflecting, which is it's a really important part of the process. We need to recognize that each of our positions and relationships are all part of this healthy ecosystem within our community and our growth is uh, unique to us. So feel free to ask whatever questions. Uh, no question is, is too uh, large or too small. So with no further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panelists today. We're so excited to have them sharing their knowledge with us. Uh, we're, we're grateful to be spending this time with them. We're here with uh, Emily Eddins Roundtree. Dr. Emily Eddins Roundtree is the Associate Director for the Center for Service Learning at the University of Kansas. She focuses on community partner and faculty engagement and service and community engage initiatives across campus. Dr. Roundtree has also spent time at Old Dominion uh, University in Norfolk, Virginia, where she was charged with creating and developing ODU's service learning initiative as the first service learning professional at the institution. She's received several major grants to develop service learning projects that address sea level rise, climate change, and conservation, one with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the other from Virginia Sea Grant. She also recently published an edited volume entitled Reconceptualizing Faculty Development and Service Learning, Community Engagement, Exploring Intersections, Frameworks, and Models of Practice. Dr. Roundtree uh, received her PhD in MS in Human Dimensions of Natural Resources from Colorado State University with a fellowship from the Center for Collaborative Conservation. She completed her research on international service learning in rural Panama. She chooses to work in service learning because of its complexity, global local significance, and the belief that collaborative processes between universities and surrounding communities can enact real social and environmental change. Welcome, Emily. Great to have you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Yes, looking forward to this. We're also here this morning with Nagora Erkeva. Dr. Nagora is also first generation immigrant, a person of color, an international student, indigenous to Central Asia, an eco feminist, uh, and interested in eco justice, decolonization, and place based scholarship. She joined the Semis Coalition leadership team in 2018 and graduated with her PhD in educational studies from Eastern Michigan University in 2021. The SEMI's acronym, it stands for Southeast Michigan Stewardship Coalition. Her research focuses on eco-justice education, place-based education, eco-feminism, settler co colonialism, post-colonial theory, social justice, indigenous wisdom, 
and the connection of local to global situation. She uses her research to build communities that are based on diversity of experiences, democratic decision-making for social and ecological sustainability and justice, and addre addressing structures and injustice as well. Her research informs her work in education and at schools by focusing on a cross-disciplinary approach to analyzing school community relationships and what roles educators can uh, play to build that inclusive, transformative, as well as democratic learning communities. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Last but not thank least. You. Oh, thank you. Also, uh, our, our last panelist, but certainly not least as we go in this order, uh, is Ethan Lowenstein, who is a professor of curriculum and instruction at Eastern Michigan University. Ethan serves as the director of the SEMIS Coalition. His responsibilities include forming and nurturing strategic partnerships, strengthening the webs of relationships within our transformative community, and working with staff to actualize their visions. He has over two decades of experience in school systems change in designing and facilitating teacher and professional learning in civic and place-based education. In recognition of his service and impact, he has received the Champion of Engagement Award from the uh, Michigan Campus Compact, the Rollins Collins Distinguished Faculty Award from EMU, the John W. Porter Distinguished Chair in Urban, Ex Urban Education, and the Dean's Award for Innovative Scholarship, the Dale Rice Award for Academic Innovation and Community Engagement, and the New York City Board of Education Teacher of the Year Award for Alternative Schools. Before his career in higher education, Dr. Lowenstein taught high school social studies at Park East High School, an alternative high school in East Harlem in New York City. Wow. So what a depth and breadth of experience Thank you for allowing me uh, to introduce each of these panelists and just take a few minutes of the time really to get grounded in who we're speaking with, their level of expertise, uh, so you can um, be engaged today fully and understand their perspectives uh, that they're bringing to the table today. So uh, the first question I'll just like to start off with the panelist is, uh, although I tried to give you uh, as brief as I could an introduction about your uh, wide ranging backgrounds, uh, some folks have wondered and have contacted us. We asked for questions to be submitted ahead of time. And uh, several uh, questions that we got were in regard to your origin stories. What brought you to this work um, to bring you with this level of passion? And uh, I don't know if Emily, if you would like to start off first and, and share those experience, and then we could just do a little round robin. Sure, absolutely. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I am excited to speak with you all today and have this conversation. Um, so a little bit about my origin story. I mean, I think that a lot of people who find themselves in service learning and community engagement is kind of a winding path. Um, I was a cultural and human geographer in undergrad at Miami, Ohio. I was always really interested in, in, in the different ways people get together and solve problems and, and share ideas. And so, and particularly in an environmental context. And so when I was looking for grad schools, I found um, human dimensions of natural resources at Colorado State. So we study how people affect the environment and vice versa. So I started my studies there and, um, and had also gotten my first job out of college was leading volunteer conservation projects in Australia. And so I had a new group of university level students from all over the US, Canada and the UK doing a new project with a new community partner with a new group of students in a new location every two weeks. And so it was a crash course in volunteer motivations and community partner relationship development and how to integrate educational experiences on in the field on the fly. And, <clears throat> and so I was so interested in the leadership aspect of it because I was I was young. I was, you know, in my early 20s and leading these groups. And there was virtually very little literature about that out there about volunteer 
leadership. There was a, a lot out there about volunteer motivations, about how volunteers work in, in higher ed, higher education, but very little on, on leadership. And so um, I conducted an autoethnography on my experiences as part of my, of my master's project and um, and then got really interested in alternative breaks, particularly as students work in communities for short periods of time. You know, we have a lot of knowledge about, you know, if, if people are in a community for a lot longer, they're able to develop those relationships. It tends to be more impactful because they are able to know the community need a little bit better. But there's what happens, you know, when students just go for short amounts of time, which is pretty typical, right? And so, um, so I started studying alternative breaks programs. Colorado State has a pretty, pretty hefty one. They send about 27 trips a year um, just, for, just for spring break. Um, so I also wanted to look at the entire system. So all of the different organizational um, entities that were part of putting together this kind of group. So I wanted to look at the university. I wanted to look at the organizations on the ground the communities themselves, the students, the leaders, and all how it all fits together, how we can maybe better determine the impact on the community, what everybody's perspectives are, and gain some, uh, some perspective from that. Um, so particularly, there was a one there was one alternative break project that had been happening in a small community on the Caribbean coast of Panama for almost 10 years at that point, they I believe they still go, um, which gosh, that would have been, that would make it almost 25 years now. Um, but it had a long-term partnership with these short-term experiences of the students actually in the community. So I looked at that um, and what I, what I gleaned from it was it was uh, pretty, pretty taxing on the community themselves. I mean, it was, it's a really small community and they don't get a lot of volunteers. And, uh, and so they had to work really hard to, to house the, the students and they loved them there, of course, and, you know, had really positive experiences, but it was, um, it was a lot of work on, on the community's part just to even house the students. And so I, with my international work and, you know, volunteer development work, I um, also, my, advisor um, in graduate school was one of those champion faculty of service learning at Colorado State. He was um, really close with the Center for Service Learning at Colorado State. And so I learned from him um, at, at the local level, TA'd his classes, uh, his service learning classes, and learned more about the ins and outs of actually a service learning class. So all of this brought me to my first position out of my PhD, was, which was starting the service learning program at Old Dominion University, which at that point, a lot of my work had been in very predominantly white communities at very predominantly white schools. Um, Norfolk is uh, about 50-50 black and white, roughly, um, and so is Old Dominion University. And so I started a program in a community and at a school where um, there were some real apparent um, disparities in students' backgrounds and uh, experiences and how they experience work in the community and their service learning experiences. Um, so I learned a lot from that and, um, and I really, really enjoyed my work at, at ODU. The faculty there, it, at the time it was an R2, now it's an R1. But I, the faculty had a lot of flexibility with their teaching, and I found um, a lot of really passionate faculty who were really invested in real cha community change in the Norfolk and Hampton Roads area. Um, and I've been working at the University of Kansas now for um, for five years. I'm from Kansas City, and so we I moved home. <laughs> but here, the Center for Service Learning, the program has been around a lot longer. I mean, the Center for Service Learning has been around since 2005. There is a lot more um, institutional structure, which I've been able to uh, enjoy. <laughs> That's not something that I had uh, um, at Old Dominion. And, um, and so I here I lead the faculty development programs, community partnership engagement, um, some of the assessments, and also in the last couple of years, we've really been working on um, 
integrating community engaged scholarship and supporting community based research throughout uh, throughout the disciplines as that's kind of an area that was previously in a no man's land, you know, under we have undergraduate research and we have the Center for Service Learning, but that community based research and, and community engaged scholarship wasn't formally formally supported. So we've been working on um, on supporting that more in the last couple of years. So that's where we are now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. I'm, I'm here taking notes. If you see me <laughs> moving around, because these are such excellent points that I think many of us here at West Virginia University want to learn more about. Uh, Nagora, would you mind sharing uh, similarly a little bit about how you were brought to this work and what your passion is uh, in this yeah. field? Yeah, Emily, it was really interesting to listen to. And I was thinking, like, where do I want to start, like, uh, as you can see, like, um, English isn't my native language, but um, I think I would like to start where I come from. So I come from Central Asia. It was part of Soviet Union and it collapsed in 1991, like Soviet Union. And I was growing up during like during the collapse, I was a really tiny kid. And uh, I think as I grew older, I started asking the questions that, like, okay, like what's the purpose of education? And like, what's our place in the world? And um, then after I did my um, bachelor degree, I said like, I really would like to learn about um, social issues because I'm realizing that I have gap in my knowledge and I would like to expand my thinking traveling outside of my home country, which is in Central Asia. So I applied um, for master's degree uh, and my uh, research focus was gender issues. So I came to Eastern Michigan University to study like social uh, social studies. While I was doing my thinking expanded and I like after I came to the United States, it was my first trip. And I realized that, oh, like we have certain culture and here's a different culture in the United States. And how do you put these two different cultures talk to each other and work with each other? So during my master's degree, um, instead of uh, getting answers to my questions, I had I started having more questions. So I said, okay, so I would like to do my PhD and explore what are the ways that people live, that what are the structures we have and what are the belief system that we have that impacts the way we think and those the way we think produces certain actions that have tangible outcomes, right? So um, that was an, um, that was the questions I was asking. And I came across this um, amazing professors that introduced me to different ways of thinking and really said like, you offer lots of things to bring to the table in terms of like your way of life and the way you see here and how we can build a community that's healthy and sustainable. And how can you connect local with global while recognizing local strengths in it, not trying to come and change it, but um, contribute to the existing healthy practices. So um, just learning through, uh, I. Um, I, I got to know Semis Coalition. It's an amazing community of teachers, students, and community partners that come together and are interested to build community that are healthy and sustainable. And when we talk about community, we don't talk about the community as only human community. So it changes as we talk. Uh, it, it's most like, and we can, as as we as we proceed, we can talk about what are the uh, lens we use. It's like one of the lens we we recognize ourselves intimately interdependent with everything that surrounds us. So the community includes humans. Community includes our surrounding. Community includes um, animals. Community includes natural world. So that came into the place and recognizing all these learnings that we are doing, what are the ways we can apply it in actually apply and work with the communities to make a solid change, like address social and ecological issues that we have and look at it and not, not approach there saying like, well, we are from the university coming to teach you how to do In fact, come to the community and say, what can you teach us? We can learn and work with, it, with you. So, that's how I came to this work and while working um, during this process. And you know, like the one thing uh, to share when you work with the community, like 
it's complex, but at the same time, it's quite rewarding. Uh, so uh, I I was able to see firsthand the impact that has when you work and you make changes and how community impacts you and how you impact the community. And you are part of the community and not outside of that community. So um, while working on that, I said, I really would like to continue. And um, currently I'm working on um, I'm leading indigenous ways of knowing initiative in SEMIS and really excited to build in the, uh, like uh, partnership with indigenous group and collaborate with students and teachers where we um, we look at purpose of education that's directed to build like like question our assumptions but also come up with ways that can um, put the foundation for a healthier community. So that's where I think I'll pass mic to Ethan. That was great. And I love, I love hearing that, Nagora, because you know, we work together, but every time we do this kind of thing, I I, you know, hear more, you know, more parts of <laughs> Nagora's story, which is, which is awesome. So it's a real honor to be here. Um, I think I'll just draw some themes. Um from Emily and Nagora that also resonate in, in my story. Um, this is gonna sound weird, but you know, I'll start with I'm a human being <laughs> um, in the sense that I think everything in my professional life and personal life starting at a certain point has been about humanizing environments um, so that you know, we create, we're able to create communities of love and belonging um, for all. Um, and at, at a certain point, I realized um, in my work uh, with Nagora and others, this hyper separation between the human and the more than human world and the disaster, the threat of like, to get real, this threat of species extinction. <laughs> I mean, many species, including our own, um, you know, that has been caused by this hyper separation. So that's been one thing that's really driven my inquiry and action is how to recognize the webs of interdependence and interconnection. And also, um, you know, it was interesting uh, and I don't know, a little embarrassing just listening to the awards in my introduction. You know, we, we live in a really individualistic society that has, and, and this goes to the points around structures. It has structures like, like rewards. It has titles like doctor in front of my name. Um, you know, these are structures, they're honor, you know, the awards are obviously honors, but I think these are structures that also um, obscure or can, um, uh, you know, are driven by belief systems that create hierarchy um, and create power relationships. Uh, I'll just give one example that I like from my experience at Eastern, where a, a, a colleague of mine pointed out, she's a lecturer, like that's her title, and she pointed out to me that the mailboxes are actually, um, you know, the mailboxes at the top are full faculty members, then come the lecturers, then come the graduate students, then come the secretary. I mean, it's like you could look at the mailboxes and understand the hierarchy in the department. Um, so I think I've also been really driven by the passion for how to disrupt those hierarchies um, in our relationships and how to live into that disruption um, and like Nagora sort of intimated, and I think in Emily, I'm sure in Emily's work too, I'm so excited, Emily, to get to know you better. Um, it's not enough to disrupt and to critique. Um, so I'm very also increasingly wary of language like anti this, anti that. My question is, what, what are we creating that's a healthy, um, healthy, sustainable, democratic? What does that look like? How do we imagine that? How do we put that into practice in our daily lives? Um, and I'll also just say that I love teaching. Like, I love teaching. That's my art form. <laughs> like, that's like I think, I breathe, whether it's adults, whether it's children. Um, so, that's also something that I just love to do as an art form. And so, I, I went into teaching with a strong social justice orientation. I mean, I have a social justice orientation, um, but I quickly realized that if you love your students, 
uh, or even that language is a little problematic. If you love the, the people who you're working with and learning with in community, in classroom communities or whatever community that you're in, um, and you see them being harmed in certain ways, then, then you're forced to ask these questions. And I really appreciate it, Emily, you're your, um, talking and, and Nagore about systems, right? So I would say that's another driver for me is that um, the systems that the belief systems, the structures, the language um, is all, um, in, unless we understand those interrelationships between systems, then we can operate in one area of the system and even create some change there. But that'll quickly go back to status quo if we're not thinking of systems lovers, powerful systems lovers, and also the interconnections between different parts of the system and operating different ways. So it 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 um, so I'm really you know interested in how do we create those relationships in 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 our classrooms that are um, co-developmental and also recognize that we're lodged in these systems that um, dick you know honestly dictate most of our behavior. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'll stop there. Um, and the Summies Coalition started 15 years ago. Um, and I, I started as director, I forget when, but I don't know, 11 or, 11 or 12 uh, years ago. So the other part of my narrative that I would just say is that, you know, I came to Michigan. I'm not from Michigan. I'm from New York City. My wife was from Michigan, came 20 years ago. And um, so I guess the question that I asked myself is, what groups am I, do I spend my time with? Um, because we all have limited time, right? What groups, which communities do we choose to immerse ourselves in and become a member of? So I'm, I'm increasingly also wary of words like partnership um, and, and more in favor of words like membership. Um, so wh who, where do we choose to be a, 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 a member of a community? Again, we have limited time and limited energies. Um, who are our mentors who are in our circles of support? And some of us feel quite isolated. Um, you know, all of us need circles of support. All of us need member mentorship um, circles. Um, and then how can we stay in the same place for a long period of time? So, you know, I would I, when I came to Michigan, I gave myself 10 years to feel a part of a community and it did take me 10 years. <laughs> so I think that that's, um, yeah, anyway, those are questions and thoughts that are just um, in my narrative that I'm, uh, yeah, drawing on. Thank you. I'm, I'm loving uh, some of these thoughts already as we're getting started. Uh, let's move forward, thinking that it, it's not enough just to disrupt, right? Uh, often I use a, a phrase, it, it's easy to hate, it's hard to create. So with that in mind, some of those themes coming out about this, what was called the uh, complex but rewarding work we're doing to try to humanize uh, these environments. Uh, some of the submitted questions that were given to us previously by uh, registrants had this theme about collaboration, partnership, uh, as you're calling it, Ethan, membership. But how do we get started? How do we initiate these relationships in a way that depicts the relationship as mutually beneficial as opposed to only benefiting us, you know, the academic or or trying to influence the community uh, from outside forces. How do we walk that tightrope? I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, so on a very practical level, um, when I am working with faculty and um, community partners and helping to create, for example, a service learning partnership or membership for a class. Um, I've actually, I, I, when I go to these things, I, I like to have resources. I like to take away resources. And so I tried to bring a couple that have been really particularly helpful for me. Um, some Something that I use and have used throughout my career over and over, perhaps more than any other external resource is, um, and this is not, I don't get anything from this promotion, but um, this this resource from Campus Compact, I think it's about a decade old. Um, it has uh, worksheets at the end of each section. 
Um, and while I provide these worksheets as a framework, I, whether they use them or not, um, I think that they ask really important questions. Um, so the one of the worksheets is particularly reflective. So it's a personal reflection. So why am I interested in this partnership? Real basic questions like what values and commitments do I have that are reflected in the goals and mission of this community organization? What assumptions am I bringing to the table? Questions like that, that I think that are important to have and take that space for yourself before you enter a partnership or before you contact somebody. The other, there's another um, worksheet that's a good guide for starting out between you and your partner. So you do these things together to kind of help create aligned values. So what do we need to know about what one another and our organizational settings to initiate this? What experience does the campus have in working with the, with a similar community organization? What experience does the community organization have with working with college students? Some basic questions just to really like kind of set the tone and set the scene and start to spark conversation. So what are some issues or questions that would um, involvement particularly arise among students? And what strengths does each partner bring to the relationship? I would also, um, one of the questions that is not on this worksheet that I think would be really important when starting out uh, a partnership is how do you define the difference between a transactional and a transformational partnership? Um, and what does it mean for sustaining partnerships? So that's the, that's the third worksheet, work, worksheet is on sustaining partnerships. So how will we know if the partnership is working? What needs to be in place to move the partnership from transactional to transformational relationship, those sorts of questions to kind of help continue on and have some real deep um, connection. Um, but those, I mean, that those are just a couple of, of resources that I bring with me. I also, I really appreciated Nagora's comment and, um, and then uh, Christy Wood Turner in the comments uplifted it, that the great point of enhancing healthy community behaviors as opposed to changing something that's been super helpful for me as an approach, just a general everyday approach throughout my career has been, um, has been an appreciative approach. Mm -hmm. So what's, what, what's already working? How can we build on what's already working? Um, those sorts of questions and, and treat the situation as something to build on rather than to a problem to fix. Um, Jorge, hey, I see your, your hand up. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's so much richness in what you guys are sharing here today. I want I, I want to um, uh, selfishly ask you for something, and and this was prompted by something that Ethan said. Um, you know, we are at a time in which academia must change yeah. if we want to be not only continuously relevant but really meeting uh, the needs of the people that we come in contact with, right? And the people that try to engage with us. So I, I will ask the same thing of, of the other two, but what advice do you have for administrators? What can we do to remove some of those barriers that do not allow you to exercise the kind of engagement that respects social justice and, you know, going back to your uh, comment, Ethan, you know, it's like a caste system and we have it in academia and it is okay to, to achieve. It is okay to try to aspire for something bigger and greater. But yeah, I mean, that example of the mailboxes, I remember my first time in academia and I saw that. I mean, as a, as a student, I saw that. I mean, graduate students, we were at the very bottom down there. We were not on the top of the mailbox. Nagora, Ethan, do you want to respond? Um, I, I could I could start um, a little bit in terms of of administrators. I think um, that I mean one of the challenges with administration is it is as you're going up the ladder. I guess my question for you would be who's in your circle of support? What communities do you belong to? Um, because there's this myth of the hero dean or this dean that's going to come in and change everything. And but but the the movement from organization to community, I would say, is really important. 
So my question, we have a new dean, and my question to them is, are you going to stick around for 15 years? Because it's going to take 15 years to do this work. Okay, so now having said that, that might not be realistic. So then my question is, how do we create wide bridges, not narrow bridges? So who are the three people in the leadership structure? Because my other question is, if we're going to launch into this work, we need to know that there's enough organizational capacity to sustain the work. Um, and another honestly has to do with institutional rewards. So one of my pet peeves are is strategic plans, value, value statements, without any systems for holding each other accountable in a positive way to those values. Well, so, you know, yeah. thank you for, yeah. you know, hitting me with a question. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that long-term engagement is critical for administrators, but I, I think I would want to ask the faculty, uh, you know, again, within the academic environment, you guys are in charge of your promotion and tenure. You really are, because you come together and define how you want, and this is the only industry in which I've, I've ever worked, where employees decide how they're going to be evaluated. So you have that opportunity in academia. You are able to really strengthen your reward system, which is your promotion and tenure system, to actually reflect what you want. So that will actually be something that is almost like a... Um, a charge to us and administrators as deans and, and so forth for us to be able to remove the barriers, to be able to respect that wish and to be able to ensure that that's part of the, uh, the make up of academia. To your question, who is my team? My team, you know, half of it is here. And I never assume that I'm gonna get anything done by myself. That, that, that's silly unrealistic, but I also belong to another team, which is that team of other deans and provosts. And I'm very fortunate here in West Virginia because people here truly are committed to engagement and understand extension too. I mean, this is amazing. But I think in a way, also as administrator, we need your reassurance that this is what you wanna do. And that you also want this to be recognized because if that voice is, is because you might feel that you are in the ranking. Well, I'm just a faculty member. But if you don't use that voice and actually as I said, your own social justice within our own academia, we cannot make the progress you wanna make. Just to add, I think I was thinking uh, about this um, hierarchy thing and that's how our structure are built and understanding. But uh, when it like even hierarchy, like to challenge this hierarchy, it's a partnership like between like, uh, like for instance, when I was student, like the partnership between me and my, like my, my teachers, you know, like, like professors that taught me and how do you manage that? I think um, it's, it's, it's not easy to challenge this hierarchy, but you also need to be given the safe space for you to be able to do that. It's not like uh, definitely voice, but also, um, finding allies that sees your understanding, but also like approach it in a way, not like um, blaming way, but uh, saying like, hey, like this is what I see and this is what barrier it's um, building. So would you meet me there? Can you help me and explain? So during that process, I noticed that I was able to build a community where I feel I felt safe. Of course, it doesn't mean it hierarchy immediately um, changed, but it definitely meant that I was able to impact them while they were able to reconsider the way they were working um, with students. Um, other thing I noticed when uh, administrators, uh, when we work as a semis coalition with uh, school administrators and how our administration was in uh, Eastern Michigan University, like, the way we approach if administrators are supportive of our work of our work it becomes sustainable it um it 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 will have a bigger impact so we work with teachers and students but when they're supported by the administration and are, like given a space to develop this kind of relationship it has um wider impact and a deeper meaningful um experiences for everyone involved 
Uh, I'm loving uh, the liveliness of this discussion, and we, we've got some great questions in the chat. Uh, I do want to circle back, though, because there may be uh, folks who are new to this series from WVU who don't really understand because I didn't do a proper introduction. Uh, dean Atiles is actually Dean of Extension and Engagement, as well as Director of WVU Extension. And our Center for Community uh, Engagement is now under this umbrella. So it's a still sort of a new but innovative approach. Uh, and that's why we're launching these series and, and trying to infuse some of these discussions across uh, a campus and our colleges. So I just want to put that out there. If there's anyone who's new in the WVU community who wants to follow up on any of these partnerships. So but there were some other great questions in the chat, uh, if I may, uh, directed uh, about specific comments uh, that folks were mentioning. Um, it's often difficult to be a panelist and present and uh, read all of the comments because they're coming in fast and furious. But there was one uh, to Ethan's point about uh, modeling ourselves within the structures. Uh, we want to see searching for leverage points in those structures to promote social justice and working at those leverage points. So would you mind speaking a little bit about finding those points of leverage? Yeah, so I think um, there's some formal ways of doing it. There's systems um, systems thinking tools that are actually designed to find points of leverage. And then Nagora mentioned the big one, which is belief systems. So, you know, if you change belief systems um, and belief systems, you know, are created and um, uh, and reinforced by language stories, um, symbols, and so on. Um, so the other thing is if you take a systems thinking approach and take, um, and Emily and Nagora, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a second with this, but taking a long view of time, then as you're in community with other folks, you're, you're looking for those levers together and you're sensing the levers. Um, as they come up because it's a dynamic system that you're in that's changing and you know so i would say it's not only the finding the leverage point but also having the adaptive capacity to um to uh, reflect adapt your work together in in community as conditions change which they change quite rapidly and from the pandemic we've seen that as well so but i would stick with belief systems but then also thinking about the, um, um, you're really looking for the lever, the action in one area of the system that's going to impact many of the other areas of the systems. And then you're thinking, which other area of the system do I simultaneously need to impact so that doesn't revert back to status quo? And you're also looking at the, the differences, the gaps between culture and systems. So, you know, so for example, um, what you're saying, Jorge, about, you know, some of the structures that are in place. Is there a gap between the structures that are in place and the culture, which is the way we're doing things? And then is there a space for discussing that gap and identifying how to close that gap? Mm -hmm. um, and that's within, um, you know, that's in relationship to a vision that you might have, a common vision that you might have. But Nagor and Emily, I'm curious about your thoughts about that. I think um, what I was thinking, like leverage point, um, it always comes for me, like for me to be able to identify a leverage point, I need to enter into a relationship <laughs> and be in it long enough to say, oh, I see, like this is, let's say um, I'm working as an example, currently I'm working with a teacher and I would like to support her in her curriculum and she wants to integrate indigenous ways of being into her curriculum. And while I'm listening to her, that would be like, okay, where can I support her that it, it provides bigger impact? You know, like what I do there, I actively listen. I need to recognize her 
um, her personal needs, but also see her in a structure that she's working. So the, in, through this conversation, you are able to find those leverage points. I I can't I can't say that there is a formula, to it, but it's like organic process where you figure out as you enter into the relationship. I completely agree. I think one of the things that we try to lead with is community need. So if we, there isn't a community need, then we're not going to do, you know, we can have all the ideas in the world, <laughs> but if there isn't, if it isn't impacting structural change in the community at some level that's identified by them, um, then, then it's just not going to happen. <laughs> so, um, so I also want to kind of build on a couple of different points that we've been making. I've seen promotion and tenure come up a couple of times and, and how faculty are rewarded and awarded and, and recognized for community engagement work. And it obviously varies from department to department, from faculty to faculty, for, to institution to institution. This is um, kind of a growing national conversation. I think that universities across the country are recognizing that they need to recognize their faculty better for this work because it is so impactful in so many different ways. Um, so I know, Ethan, you said you don't like strategic plans, but I, I jumped on, this was my change lever at KU because that we, um, we are redoing our strategic plan for the university and part of um, part of that was to look at community or faculty reward systems and community engagement. And so I kind of jumped on it as a, um, as a study, <laughs> as, as a self-study and a, a study of what is going on out there at other, other schools, what's been, um, what are people putting into place. Um, and so I am just going to share my screen really quick and I'll, um, I'll, send this as part of the package that can be shared, but um, I just did an overview of all of a lot of the resources that are just available online um, about what folks are doing um, and what's being, what's being, uh, being said as being effective at their universities. So um, there are a number of ways that, that faculty are being recognized across, um, across the country. Um, so we are taking a look at that and, um, it, I think that it, it is a difficult, um, topic to approach because it does tend to vary by department. And so it, it does kind of come down to this real kind of almost micro level institutional change, but what can we do at the structural level, at the institutional level to help kind of push those things along? Um, but yeah, I'll share, I'll share that resource, but we, um, I think it's an important part of the, the national conversation and as part of our roles as community engagement um, practitioner scholars to, to help move that forward. Great, thanks for all, all of the, the broad based discussion as well as the specifics people are always interested in in the specific tools that can help them move this work forward. So I will uh, just remind everyone uh, that we will be following up with links to resources afterwards. So that's another benefit that you get for signing up uh, for this uh, series. All, all of our uh, scholars uh, will be sharing their links and we'll follow up and provide that information. But uh, circling back to, to some of the initial conversations, bringing partners on board. Uh, how do we really uh, drill down uh, with some of these communities to establish the relationship? Folks might be interested in a um, particular research goal, but how do we move that research data to actions, especially when working with nonprofits and, and community partnerships? And I think this question, this was submitted uh, by someone ahead of time. And I think they're they're mainly thinking if they didn't have uh, those partnerships already established, if that makes sense, or if they're going uh, after large scale grants uh, in an area of their expertise, but they're trying to establish those partnerships after they already have a certain research agenda. I'm happy to 
I jump in on this one. We are working on this um, currently, uh, as particularly when it comes to working on larger grants and how to in integrate community engagement approaches and strategies into, into larger grants. We're um, just this year, last summer, we got one um, with a $24 million five-year NSF project called Arise. It's Adaptive and Resilient Infrastructures dri Driven by Social Equity. Um, and it's essentially a partnership between KU, K-State, Wichita State, and other smaller schools and colleges throughout Kansas to take a look at how can we make infrastructures regarding um, in the areas of water, transportation, and energy more resilient. Um, when I talk to my friends about what, you know, what this is about, it's like, well, you remember when Texas's grid fa failed? Like, essentially, let's not be Texas. Or, you know, like, how do we make our systems more resilient? And, and with this piece of driven by social equity. So one of the approaches that we're taking is, um, is training of the research team. Um, we are making sure that everyone on the research team has a foundational understanding of community-based research and what it means to do that. Um, one of the more pivotal strategies that we're employing is we're, um, we're, em we're employing community engagement advocates. So we are identifying folks in the communities where we're working that are particularly connected, have a background in resilience or environmental justice. They um, are, are civically engaged and are able to um, kind of speak both languages because there are a lot of engineers on this project. It is a lot of mechanical um, and chemical engineer, a lot of data scientists, some social scientists, but it's a lot of folks that you know, have particular language that they use as part of their discipline that doesn't necessarily translate to smaller communities and, and urban communities and stuff like that. So we have um, this, we have these people that we are kind of employing and we're working with them to kind of create that flow of information and help support better understanding of the work that the researchers are doing and the needs of the community and how it, things are gonna work. So, and hopefully we are just at the beginning stages of this. And I know that this is a um, strategy that's been employed in other places, but I uh, am very much looking forward to seeing how that, um, how those channels can can come together and, and better support the, the, the infrastructure resilience in those communities. <laughs> Great, thank you for, um, and congratulations, by the way, on, on such a great grant, it seems really needed and applied. So I'll just circle back to that because there have been several questions that were submitted to us and in the chat about this value of community engagement so that the community still perceives academia as more self-serving, generating uh, grants and publications and trying to obtain tenure uh, as, as we go through our careers, but how does it benefit communities? How does it help them in their basic daily challenges and struggles? How do we change those perceptions? And I, I think another question that might be linked to this is how do our, we disseminate our community engaged scholarship other than in journals in ways that can be effective to change these perceptions in communities? So, uh, I'll just throw that out for anyone that might have thoughts on this this bigger picture of idea of changing those perceptions so it is more mutually beneficial. I could I could start a little bit um, with that. I think there's um, we're thinking a lot about, and Eastern is incredibly supportive of community engaged work. I mean that's part of our our history. It's um, it, we have very strong values uh, and but also what is it what does it mean to be doing community embedded research um you know i think is really i love what you're saying um emily and you know there's a variety of things um, in the resources that nagora and i will share um i've included a blog post of a a 10 minute little speech that i gave at a at an award ceremony um a couple of weeks ago. And part of it is that the like short periods of public speaking 
um, if the language is clear, if it um, if it invokes an embodied feeling of the vision, then people can identify. Yes, that's the feeling. That's that I want to connect with that. <laughs> um, you know, and then also, you know, if you're writing articles, um, I think articles about theory are very important. And maybe Nagora, you could talk a little bit to build on what Emily was saying about our um, this idea of transactional partnerships versus transformational. Um, if you can represent that in a very elegant way as a tool, as a mental model for folks to use, and it's not in an academic language that is prohibitive for others. So I think that's another question we need to ask ourselves is who is the audience? Um, what is the language and representational forms that are accessible? And then the only other question I wanna raise is I think my question is who is the community? Um, so for example, in Detroit, unbelievably complicated place, you know, you could be in one neighborhood and you would have to show up in that neighborhood and listen and be in that neighborhood for a while in order to understand what's going on there and also to understand like what Emily is saying around what the need is. And I think this idea of showing up, um, there's not one community and there's often conflicts in community. <laughs> There's interest in this part of the community that conflict with interest in this part of the community. So we have to be very sort of careful with how we um, use the word community and then also make very commitments to specific communities because it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to show up. And I love this structure, Emily, that you're talking about in terms of this um, almost an ambassador um, mm. type structure and so anyway, those are some thoughts, but Nigor, I wonder if you want to talk more about that. Emily, well, I was listening to you and I really like what you said. You said there's, uh, there are technical language and we have the community, like, and we try to translate it and to make it accessible, right? For the community, because like what I did notice myself, if there's this really scientific big uh, idea, what I do type in Google is like, explain this for kids. And I understand it much better. And I'm like, oh goodness, like why didn't I do that earlier? So, and then after the kids, then I can look at this grown up language, which I think I am one of those grown ups, but doesn't make sense when I read that. So, what I did realize um, in Semis Coalition, uh, we also, we work with students and teachers, right? Like we bring this, um, uh, our focus is how we can become better uh, stewards of the, our communities and to address social and ecological issues. In this process, what we learned is there's um, like, tons of data and a language that's not easily accessible for students. And what are the ways we will translate it in a way that um, it's, it's easy to grasp, but also allows all of us to make the changes in the community. So we do the same similar things, but when it comes to the question of like, most of the time academia has been known, like coming to the community, like, do extractive approach like hey like I am here with a partner to do the partnership but my approach like learn a little bit about it publish and leave so that's we are quite aware of that especially with the social um, and ecological background that uh, leads our work you have to really pause also and because it's crucial to recognize the culture works through us like sometimes we are in this structure that we keep forgetting that Oh, like we might be like having certain ideas like, oh, like how I can get to this outcome. Yes, like it's important to look at the outcome, but also recognize how I can recognize and um, place myself in the community where I build um, reciprocal, like transformational partnership. So Emily talked earlier about uh, two kinds of partnership. Like she said, what did you say? Like transformational, the other one, you know, let no. Was it transactional? Yeah, transactional. Yeah. yeah. So, um, in the experience of semis, we like within this fifteen years of existence, we also had quite an extensive experience in partnership, and we realized that uh, when we come into um, when we build a, a relationship with other community organizations, we recognize that 
different community organizations are at different level of their development, just like we are, and sometime, and they're at different level of their capacity and um, get opportunities, you know? So uh, we realized that there are like big three umbrella, like uh, <laughs> names orientation to partnership. Like one of the partnership we had examples of like, we had unilateral partnership, yeah? Like, like we came into the partnership and, that both teams were like, what can I get out for myself through this partnership? That was unilateral approach, which wouldn't last long and doesn't have much impact. The second type of the partnership we realized was, um, uh, what, how would I call it? Uh, like reciprocal, like we understand both of our needs and we say, okay, let's let's partner to meet each other's needs. But what's sustainable and impactful in the community, we realize it's transactional partnership, uh, like transformational partnership, just like what Emily, Emily suggested. That means like you come together and say, these are the, my strengths I offer and these are the needs. And how can we create this partnership where uh, it will be directed to long-term outcomes. Since we think of like system thinking, like system thinking lays out the approach where any relationship we enter is gonna come into fruition in, in during the long period of the time. And when we come to the community and recognize that academia has been, uh, has um, earned, um, earn the idea like well we come to the community do the work and do we are well aware of this assumptions and we also <laughs> um, check our own assumption and what are our vision what we want to see and where we can find uh, synergies and where we work together to make a long-lasting change and to break that down I think it it might like the sim like it's it might seem simple, but it's not at the same time simple. Like you need to build trust. <laughs> it takes time. It takes it takes time to build a relationship. It takes time to show up in the community. It takes time to be part of the community change. One of the examples I can bring, we have an um, amazing partnership with one of the local organization in Detroit. And um and we had like after after several um several after a year of this partnership and I think this partner opened up to us saying you know first time when I um started partnership with you I wasn't sure what to think I felt like uncomfortable and we asked like I'm, I'm really curious like why would you why did you feel uncomfortable and she said um I felt like I thought like you're bourgeois, like you would come and tell all these educated people, do the research, and you would look down upon and say, like, oh, what you're doing, like let us teach you what to do, right? Instead, what I did find was you came to learn with us, and I appreciated that approach. And that opened up like space in my um heart to work with you. So that uh that to to challenge and change certain ways of behavior requires modeling how it looks like but also create that relationship over a period of the time i don't know if i answered that but this this was the thinking that was going in my head and i was like that makes sense sometimes like you forget about that, but then when you talk and build a relationship that makes, like that has a powerful impact. And I think other thing I learned through my research, for instance, like I come from Central Asia and when the Central Asia is started, it's like whenever it started from this Giza perspective, the inch I get like, oh my goodness, don't give me that look, like don't study as if I'm an object to be studied, you know? So I think that perspective, like constantly in my head when I'm working with the community. I'm not coming to study them. I'm coming to say what are the strengths that I can offer and what strengths you have that we can work together to make a change. I'm just loving this rich conversation here. So you, you've you all touched on elements of, of this next question, uh, but people are really interested in, in case studies and best practices and success stories. 
but sometimes it, it can be difficult when you're uh, working uh, with underserved populations. Many folks in West Virginia work with groups from low, lower socioeconomic statuses. West Virginia is always running a neck and neck. The latest research I saw was Mississippi, Louisiana, New Mexico, West Virginia, all between 17, 19 percent um, below uh, the federal federal poverty line. Let's keep in mind that's that's not a living wage. That's below the federal poverty line. So could you talk a little bit about any specific Im impactful results that you've had or success with particular uh, communities that uh, have underserved populations um, and either in any of your work or other colleagues or folks who you admire uh, in this area as being very successful uh, in these relationships? Emily, do you want to start or? You can start if you want. I, I mean, I it's it's funny. We've had a lot of success and it's also so complicated <laughs> and so messy that it's really the stick with itness, I would say. And then also to build on Nagora's point is not only do people have to be um, open to telling each other when things might not be working for them within that messiness, but you have to carve out the time and the emotional energy to quickly uh, address people's needs. And, and so the success stories I would say is that we've been able to accumulate an, and, and so resources are important. Um, mostly I think because they allow for us to be human with each other. I don't know how many of you have experienced this, but people are so strained. Um, people's children are so strained in terms of mental health issues. There's been so much loss that, you know, I started by saying you have to be a human being or that's an important Hello. recognition. Oh, um, that that's an important recognition. Um, and that means that within your organization and also within your partnerships, people need to be able to step back and step forward um, in order for the effort to continue. And you need to model that. You can't not do that. If you stop modeling caring behavior, loving behavior within that messiness, um, the whole thing is the whole the whole thing is given up, I would say. Be, because you're, that's what erodes um, trust. So the successes that we've had have been based on being able to, for example, when the pandemic broke out, we stopped everything, we gave up all our programming, and we held, held town hall, halls as, an, as a coalition. We had students who um, we asked to publicly talk about their needs. We developed a new set of appreciative inquiry questions based on surveys, focus groups, think tanks, and we did this all within two weeks <laughs> because we knew that the conditions had so radically changed and we moved everything online <laughs> and we differentiated our programs. And it was also such a strain on our staff, that amount of effort, that if we had not had such a, if we had not modeled the kinds of caring democratic consensus decision-making behaviors in that and with our partners, then um, we would not have been able to survive, survive that. And the amount of trust that that built that we did give up no matter what the grant deliverables were, <laughs> you know, we spoke to our grantors obviously, but we, we were also conscious that, you know, we, we have to do that, but we also, the most important thing is that we we take care of each other in this moment. So I would call that a success story, um, you know, being able to do that. Huge, huge success for, story. Thank you for explaining that and, and all of the complications that go into it. Nagora, did you uh, have Just to, to offer there? Just to add to Ethan's, I think um, 
when we are working like yeah we have grants right like we say like hey we have this great idea we would like to work with this population and you find a grant to make it happen i think yes there are grants and grant deliverables but also i think what comes into the play um in our experience because like it's it's complex it's it's not like like you you write one thing and you recognize that the needs like different needs emerge so during that process i think we also learned uh we work with teachers with um from low income communities right like and the the place i live is my child goes to that school and i i see how that impacts and what we realize is uh what what support we can give during these processes instead of saying hey like we have this agenda let's keep going <laughs> saying like okay pause like if basic needs are not bad like can you go for that what are the like how do you humanize like understanding and starts there like what can we do now for us to recognize the challenges that are coming across so that's one of the changes like the approach we like i i we've like i found and the xemis coalition found uh, impactful in this process yeah i think one of the takeaways i'm gonna um come out of this with is um is ethan your point of creating humanizing environments i love that i'm gonna use that now <laughs> um i i think and i don't think i recognized it as this before but one of the strategies that we use um, is just to create space for folks to come together and intentionally connect. Um, we have a program in the fall called Pancakes and Partnerships. We just have breakfast together and you know have have space to be able to to talk to each other about our our needs and our goals and our visions. Um, and we've started actually doing smaller ones based on um, particular social and environmental issues. So we just had one focused around youth development. So we invited a, a you know a bunch of community organizations and folks on campus who we know are focused on moving um, issues in youth development forward. So um, so we really try to be intentional about the 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 spaces that we are creating. One of the, um, I think I'll offer as a, as a case study, and I, I think it kind of speaks to some of the best practices, um, is one of the grants that I worked on, um, and yes, funds funds are very helpful when, when having, you know, wanting to move some of these things forward, but we, we had the Virginia Sea Grant, NOAA grant at, at, when I was at Old Dominion University, and sea level rise is a major major issue there. Um, it's second to New Orleans in the country. It rains two drops and the whole city's flooded. And of course, um, really impacts uh, underprivileged communities it, much more. Um, I mean, some of the some of the richer communities that are experiencing flooding are literally putting these, you know, 100 year old homes on stilts in the area. I mean, it's really like, it's really impact, impacting everywhere, but of course the areas that ha have less resources are, are having a harder time. So one of the problem, one of the things that we did was we created space. We brought together organizations and universities. There's a lot of, there are a number of universities in that area, um, Christopher Newport, um, Norfolk State, Hampton University, William & Mary, all came together, a couple of different community colleges um, and about 80 different community organizations all focused on resilience and climate change in some form or another and justice. And so um, what came out of that was we created a mini grant program. So if folks found partnerships that worked for them and that they wanted to move things forward, we um, then were able to distribute some funds based on, based on that. And one of them was a partnership, a service learning course partnership between an architecture course at Hampton University and an engineering course at ODU, which is a, another best practice interdisciplinary um, partnerships between um, between universities and courses is, is a best practice. And then what they did is they worked with um, the Civic League. So Norfolk is very neighborhoody. We have they have civically engaged 
um, civic league. So folks are really, um, really identify with the neighborhoods that they live in. And there are structures in place coordinated by the city to help support that. So that's actually as far as community engagement goes, like it was very helpful for me <laughs> in my community engagement um, endeavors there because there was already that civically engaged culture. Um, but that that was their kind of inroad to be able to, um, to speak to community members directly about what they're experiencing, how they're, how they're experiencing sea level rise, what they're strife is one of the things that um, is really common in the area is that folks are adapting and they don't even realize that it's adaptation, you know, like, well, I know it's raining, so I can't go down the street. I have to reroute, you know, myself just because it's raining. And I mean, that's a form of adaptation, but, you know, it, should it be that way? <laughs> so, um, so the students came together, uh, gathered all this information, developed a, plan, a set of plans and recommendations for the city of Norfolk, the city of Norfolk then um, took those plans and got a $120 million HUD grant to, to implement um, some of what the students had come up with, which was really incredible. I mean, as far as success goes, like obviously like funding wise, like that's a really big um, success. But what I think best practice wise for that particular like, case was that it wasn't just the organizations that were involved. It was the community members themselves and the voices being used directly from the folks that are living in the communities to integrate into the plans that are being gonna be implemented in their in their own communities. And so um, that's not always the case with, with structures when it comes to, you know, what are we gonna do about sea level rise, we can create a levy, levy here or, you know, whatever. But um, I think it's just as far as a case study uh, has multiple elements of success, I think. It's not perfect by any means, but yeah, I think it includes some elements of best practices. It's so funny because that's like, it's our work is so similar and I can't wait to talk to you more about everything <laughs> that you're doing. Um, but I think this idea of it's not enough to... Um, to give resources out. What right. I'm hearing in your example is that you've created a really elegant structure, very thoughtful structure um, per with a purpose. And then there's resources coming out through this mini grant where people have agency in the community to use those resources according to their local conditions and context. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a critical, critical piece because it's not enough just to give out money it's creating the structures to use those purposefully and thoughtfully. And I just really appreciate that example. Yeah, these are all great examples. I'm seeing other comments in the chat uh, around these community connections, but I, you've probably all heard the quote that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So those little touches of spending time, I love, you know, the thought about food, how important that is. So just the whole concept of breaking bread with one another and having folks get to know you and, and building in that time for trust and space with uh, community partners is important. So I'm going to pause here and just see if there are any specific questions uh, that participants uh, want to ask. If anyone wants to unmute and ask a question or raise their hand or Put something in the chat that they really wanted us to cover uh, before we wrap up because I've got a list of 20 questions that I'm interested in and uh, that other people have submitted, but you've done such a good job of covering so many things. I just wanted to provide that space uh, for folks to, to ask a question. I'm not uh, hearing or seeing any, then I'll just ask uh, each of you if you wouldn't mind uh, wrapping up. We have many folks here who are interested, who are passionate, but maybe have not taken that first step, you know, outside of the campus to sort of develop these partnerships and connections. So what would you say, what advice would you give or encouragement would you give to sort of folks who are new or emerging scholars in this area? I could give two pieces of advice. One you you might have heard before, but 
you have to really integrate research service um, and teaching like tightly. And it has to, one thing that I do is I'll try something in one area and then integrate it into all the other areas. And so I could quickly learn how to use a tool or an approach or an idea. Um, so that's one. And then the other is to really start small and, and find one other person at your institution and one person in the community you could start hanging out with. I mean, I don't, I think a lot of times it's really intimidating um, to hear of all these success stories. Um, but we all started off really small. And, and so that's just really important. And, and, um, and to fail your way forward, um, which again is really common to hear right now, but you really have to just be gentle with yourself. It's really complicated work and so challenging now and just be gentle and, um, and appreciate you know, the amazing things that are coming out, even if they seem really small at that moment. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, um, that starting small and dipping your toe in is a, is a good, uh, a good place to start. I think, um, if you're working with students, I think that, um, uh, focus on reflection with them and also, um, just, a conversation about being professional and working with communities a lot of you know a lot of folks who do service learning work are maybe the only faculty member in their department or maybe there are you know just a couple of you but um but I would also seek out colleagues that are are doing this work and and there is um community I would also use your use your community engagement people use Melissa use your use your folks who are who are it is their job to help um to help shepherd you through this this work and help to brainstorm and to help problem solve and create connections a lot of times they ha they know what's going on in the community so um if you have ideas i would definitely use your your community engagement and service learning people and the community on campus around you um i also would just maybe if there's like a instructional designer on campus. I mean, I from a very practical perspective, um, if you're wanting to do a service learning course, take a take a critical look at your at your syllabus and see where, you know, where things fit through can fit through. Also with your research, like how does how would this impact your research? And and as Ethan said, there are whether whether you, sometimes you plan to or not, um, I think that the the integration and the connection among your um, research service and teaching just sort of happens <laughs> when you do community engagement work because you start to see the the interconnectedness between what you're doing and in your research and your teaching. Um, but yeah, I think those are some of the pieces of advice I would give. Yeah, I, I love I love what you said, Emily. You said like how uh, your research can inform your community engagement. Like, and I think should be informing your community engagement because that's your strengths and that's what you bring to the table. One of the things that I thought um, to think through if someone is new is coming to this community engagement field, I would say like, um, like pause and uh, like identify your own assumptions before you enter the community. It's really crucial, like what assumptions you come with, why, where it comes from and ask the questions and the relationship you are building. Is it harming community or is it building st a stronger community? I think that's one of the things uh, each of us needs to grapple. Uh, sometimes like it gets unnoticed, but that's gonna impact the whole set of um relationship you're gonna build and that the impact it's gonna have down the road to academic community and the community you're working with so that's my two cents thank you all for those those points i love that i'm just always amazed when people are able to provide such a broad range of experience and big picture thinking, as well as uh, those thoughtful touches about the micro interaction. So uh, thank you for your time uh, today. I will uh, ask uh, Melissa uh, if she would like to uh, tell us about any upcoming series or opportunities. And I just wanna thank Melissa uh, for all of her connections and deep interest in this work. And uh, anyone uh, who is on the panel who 
wants more information, uh, we have an academic community engagement newsletter as well as a community partner letter, all kinds of resources. So thanks to all of the panelists. Uh, thank you, Melissa, for putting this together. If you uh, wanted to wrap us up with any final words. Just my immense gratitude for this amazing panel. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I wrote down a lot of gems <laughs> that you shared, so thank you. Um, I will be sending out a video link as well as all these resources that are being shared in the chat as well as shared um, while you were talking. So we do have another eighth webinar coming up or, or seminar is what we like to call them on April 14th, and that will be in our follow-up email. So. Um, you'll you'll receive that very soon. Um, thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate your time. And um, if you have additional questions, um, please contact the Center for Community Engagement. Yeah, thank you. This has been really great. Um, yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Like, I really love the question that made me think a little bit deeper and say like, huh, like, how do you answer that? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks to the panelists. Thank you, all the participants. Uh, we will be following up and look for the registration for the next IA series, as Melissa mentioned, building outcomes around engagement experiences. Thanks for all your time and interest today. I look forward to following up with us. <laughs>